If you have a Bible, you might like to have it open at the passage it was read earlier. They will be jumping around uh, to a lot of other passages as well. <clears throat> I should have said at the start, it's good to be with you. And uh, thank you for inviting me back once again. Uh, <clears throat> so, as Andy said, we're looking this evening at the title of the Lord, uh, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. <clears throat> What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So said Juliet in Shakespeare's famous play, Romeo and Juliet. And of course, that's certainly true. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. But to call a rose a deadly nightshade would be both inaccurate and would render the plant somehow less attractive, wouldn't it? We know that names do matter. And that's particularly true when it comes to the name of God, as it is by his name that we learn his character. The most precious name for God in the Old Testament is, of course, Jehovah. I am that I am. It's a name that immediately tells us of his eternal, unchanging character. And to the ancient Israelite, it spoke of him as the faithful, covenant-keeping God, a God who does not change. And it's perhaps with this thought in mind that God said to Moses back in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. By my name, Jehovah, I was not known to them. Now, we know that God had said to Abraham, I am the Lord that brought thee up out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. That's in Genesis 15, verse 7. So Abraham had known the bare name of God. But it would seem that not till the time of Moses was the full realisation of what that name entailed made known. And now as we come to this series of lectures on the divine name, it's plain that as time went on, the Lord added phrases uh, to his name, like the one we are considering this evening, to underscore certain aspects of his character and relationship with his people. So as I say, that the title I've been given for this evening is The Lord Who Heals, Jehovah Rapha, and the phrase is found in the passage that was read to us in Exodus 15, there at the end of verse uh, 26. <clears throat> I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's what it says. The context, uh, of course, is this uh, remarkable incident of the healing of the waters at Mara. So let's want three points tonight. The first one is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals the waters. That's what has happened here, isn't it? The bitter waters were made sweet in answer to Moses' prayer and by the strange expedient of uh, casting a tree that the Lord had shown him into those same waters. It's worth noting that this is by no means the only time in the Bible uh, where God is described as healing waters. Uh, the next such occasion is in the life of Elisha at Jericho. The incident is recorded in uh, the second book of Kings, uh, chapter 2, and uh, verse uh, 19 uh, to 22. The men of the city said to Elisha, uh, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is Nought and the ground barren. That word nought could be translated bad. And he said, bring me a, a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. 
And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. But notice, although Elisha was the speaker, he may explain this is what the Lord has said, and what the Lord has done. He is the one who has healed the waters. We also have the remarkable vision towards the end of Ezekiel's prophecy in Ezekiel 47, where the prophet sees waters flowing out of the temple toward the east. And we read, then he said unto me, these waters issue out toward the east country, and go down to the desert, go into the sea, which being brought forth unto the sea, the waters shall be healed. <clears throat> well, so far, so good. Uh, but if all that that was being referred to by the Lord, uh, taking to himself the name Jehovah Rapha, was simply the purifying of waters on two or three occasions, it would scarcely be of sufficient interest to occupy us for a whole evening, would it? <clears throat> but of course, the main thrust of Exodus 15.26 is not that God is the Lord who heals the waters so that the people can drink, but God is the Lord who heals the people themselves God is saying in effect I who healed these waters am the one who heals you so we move straight on to our second point Jehovah Rapha the God who heals his people and do the people need healing we just read the tail end of the jubilation following uh, the successful passage through the Red Sea and uh, the destruction of uh, the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. The people of Israel have joined <coughs> in with the triumphant song of Moses and then uh, of Miriam, <coughs> extolling the mighty power of God in bringing them through at the same time as drowning their enemies. With what confidence they can face the future now. Can't they? Or can they? Here at the very first test of faith, and verse 25 may explain that it was a test of their faith. There he proved them. There he tested them. The people fail the test. They fall in murmuring and complaining against Moses as they were to do so many times subsequently in their wilderness wanderings. And ultimately, of course, in complaining against Moses, they were complaining against God. And we do well to reflect on that, don't we? When we complain against the intermediate sources or causes of our frustration, are we actually complaining against the God who has put them there? So look at the whole of verse 26 then, where God said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do, wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Do you say what he's, see what he's saying? Uh, in referring to the diseases which he had brought upon the Egyptians, the Lord is referring to the plagues uh, which had, among other things, killed their livestock, caused boils to break out on their skin, ruined their crops and slaughtered their firstborn. And God is implying, notice, that his people deserve to experience the very same thing. If you will keep my word, these things won't come upon you. But if they don't keep God's word, they could expect the same treatment. If they will hear his word, listen to his voice, they will be spared because he is the Lord who heals them. 
And we see God then graciously healing his people on other occasions during their wilderness wanderings. Think, for example, of the incident in, in Numbers chapter 21. What a fa famous uh, account <clears throat> when a number of the people are, are bitten uh, by uh, fiery serpents. The Lord, verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among them again because of their complaining. And they bit the people and much people of Israel died. And the Lord prescribed the way then by which uh, those who were not quite dead could yet be healed. Telling Moses, uh, make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live and so it came to pass it's worth noticing again in connection with this incident that their physical sickness was again caused by the fact of their complaining against God so they were not doing that which was right in his sight and so they suffered these deadly poisonous bites that led to death God provided the means for their physical restoration of course that's what healing means doesn't it it's the process of restoring a person to health again and it's very plain in the context of Israel's failure at Mara, but the primary thought is one of restoration to spiritual health and well-being. After all, unlike the fiery serpent incident that I've just mentioned in Numbers, at Mara there was no physical disease among the people themselves. They had evidently tasted the water, that it was bitter, but they weren't made ill by it, so far as, so, so far as we're told. But there was clearly the need for spiritual healing among these people in the light of the whole complaining episode. And of course there are other scripture passages that make this even more plain. Think for example of uh, Isaiah chapter 1 <clears throat> where God describes his, uh, his chosen people in uh, very stark and uh, uncomplimentary uh, words. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4, he's addressing the, the nation of, of Judah. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Yes, sin is a moral and spiritual sickness. There have been several high-profile scandals, uh, mostly in the USA, in recent years, where men have had to resign their pastorates owing to some moral failure. Some of them financial scandals, some of them sexual scandals, I think all of them involving an abuse of power. And uh, like others, I've been slightly perturbed when the churches involved have sometimes seemed to minimize the grievousness of what has happened often by describing the fallen minister as now seeking healing rather than needing to repent the impression given is almost that the man concerned is as much a victim of the situation as anybody else who may have been affected and clearly that's wrong they are not victims, they are perpetrators. But nevertheless, having said all of that, 
it is true that when a man falls in this way, he is indeed demonstrably spiritually sick in the same way that Judah was sick in Isaiah's day. And sin is a spiritual sickness which we cannot heal by ourselves. So it was with ancient Israel. Already scarcely out of Egypt, here at Marah, they had shown how spiritually sick they were. What grace then it was for the Lord in that situation to declare, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And from that first use of the picture of God as the healer of his people, that theme then becomes a recurring one throughout the Old Testament. Consider, for example, the following references. You may not want to look them all up now. Uh, but in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 39, you can look them up if you want to. Uh, God himself returns uh, to, to that theme where he says, See now that I, even I am he, there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. I think of the opening words of Psalm 103, uh, the psalm on which our last hymn is based. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and so on. Again, speaking of the gospel age in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 22, the prophet declares of, of Egypt, Israel's old enemy. And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord. And he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. That must have been remarkable for the Israelites, mustn't it? To reflect on God saying, yes, even your ancient enemies, one day they will be healed as well. And think of the remarkable words in uh, Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs, literally I understand sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, literally pains, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Yes, the one spoken of in that famous passage would be the healer of his people. In Hosea, chapter 6, verse 1, that prophet anticipates the people having suffered severe chastisement for their waywardness, encouraging one another. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. The fact that Hosea then has to reprove the people for the superficiality of their repentance does not hide the fact that they had correctly brought to mind the Lord's comments back in Deuteronomy that he is the one who wounds and also the one who heals. And the Lord himself presses that point home later in Hosea chapter 11, verse 3. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them and as well as plain statements and assertions uh, by the prophets and by God himself or of this sort there are also instances of the Lord healing uh, individuals uh, aren't there in the Old Testament one example for example is, is that of uh, Jeroboam the first who suffered some sort of paralysis uh, while stretching out his hand to order the arrest of the prophet from Judah who had prophesied against him that incident's recorded in 1 Kings 13. On being paralysed, uh, Jeroboam asked the prophet to pray for him. Whereupon we read, And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was, was restored him again, and became as it was before. Sadly, however, in Jeroboam's case, the physical healing was not matched by any spiritual restoration. A happier example, and a Perhaps the more famous one is found in 2 Kings 5, the healing of the Syrian commander Naaman from his leprosy. 
after eventually and reluctantly following the message from Elisha to go and wash seven times in the Jordan, we read of Naaman that his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. He was completely healed. And it's noteworthy that in this case, his physical healing was clearly accompanied by a spiritual change of heart. And he knew that ultimately the source of this healing was the God of Israel. And so he said to Elisha, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. At the same time that he was cured of his leprosy, he was cured of his unbelief and came to a living faith in the God of Israel. Although he still clearly had some slightly superstitious ideas, hence his request for two mules burden of earth from Israel, for example, we're left in no doubt that here is a man who has been healed both physically and spiritually. There can be little doubt, I think, that in proclaiming himself as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord has primarily in view the need of his people for spiritual healing. After all, as we've seen on that first occasion, back at Mara, the people were not physically sick, but their complaints brought to light their spiritual malaise. And God, in his grace, revealed himself as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Let's move on then thirdly and look at Jehovah Rapha in the New Testament. I suggest that what we've seen of the title of God in the Old Testament should bring into focus the striking significance of the healing miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his apostles when we come to the New Testament. Now it's true that the very first miracle Jesus did, as recorded in John 2, is not a healing miracle. But interestingly, like the miracle at Mara in Exodus 15, it involved improving the properties of water. In Exodus, bitter water was simply made sweet. In John 2, water stored for washing is turned into the finest wine. What's more, even if the very first miracle is not properly a healing miracle, the second one certainly is. John records in chapter 4 of his gospel the healing of the nobleman's son who was healed by a word. And when we come to the synoptic gospels, Matthew and Mark both make plain that from the very start of Jesus' Galilean ministry, healing miracles authenticated his message. Hear how Matthew describes it in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And then following the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew immediately records uh, a number of healing miracles. Uh, the first of which is the healing of the leper who prayed, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Notice how superior the healing of this leper was to the one, to the miracle performed on Naaman. Unlike Elisha, in his dealings with Naaman, Jesus directly responds to the man's prayer rather than just sending him a message. Naaman had hoped that Elisha would strike his hand over the leprosy, but Elisha didn't do so. Jesus, however, stretches forth his hand and touches the leper. Naaman recognised that Elisha would need to call on the name of the Lord his God. Jesus had no need to do that, but healed in his own name, saying, I will be thou clean. Naaman had to wash seven times in the Jordan 
before he was cleansed. Here, this man is immediately cleansed on the word of Jesus. Following this, we have the account of the healing of the centurion's servant and the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And then Matthew makes another general comment in chapter 8, verse 16. Uh, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. And he then goes on to make this very significant observation. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And there, of course, Matthew is directly quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 4, which I mentioned earlier. He tells us that that prophetic passage is fulfilled in the healing miracles of the Lord Jesus. Which is interesting, of course, because we tend to view Isaiah 53 as a passage pointing most clearly, perhaps most clearly of any passage in the Old Testament, to the sufferings of the Saviour on the cross. And to see the physical healings of Jesus as a picture of the spiritual healing that is procured through his death. I think that the explanation given in the book uh, Pierce for Our Transgressions, published a number of years ago now by Steve Jeffrey and, and others, is very helpful. They comment with respect to the quotation in Isaiah 53 verse 4 in Matthew 18, 17. Uh, D.A. Carson argues that the apparent discrepancy arising from Matthew's application of a text about atonement to a situation about healing, and then they quote uh, Carson, is resolved if Matthew holds that Jesus' healing ministry is itself a function of his substitutionary death by which he lays the foundation for destroying sickness. They continue, this is exactly what we would expect, for sickness is one of the consequences of the curse on creation resulting from Adam's sin. In his atoning death, Christ endured and exhausted this curse, preparing the way for the inauguration of a new creation through his resurrection. And it's important to keep that last point in mind. If you encounter people who tell you healing is included in the atonement, therefore you should claim healing. You shouldn't have any physical uh, illness at all. That, that's uh, a misreading of the passage. But it's clear that the physical healings that took place in our Lord's time should be seen as a powerful picture of the greater healing of sin. And Jesus himself confirmed that this was the purpose of his healing miracles when he dealt with the paralysed man that was uh, brought to him. That's recorded, uh, sticking with Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 to 6. A few verses after the allusion to, to Isaiah 53 in chapter 8, referring to those who, uh, or rather responding to those who accused him of, of blasphemy for telling the paralysed man that his sins were forgiven, Jesus said, whether it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise Take up thy bed and go unto thine house. Indeed, even before that incident, Jesus had identified himself as the great uh, physician. It's Mark who records that little exchange in, in Mark chapter 2. Uh, when the uh, scribes and Pharisees uh, asked the question, In verse 16 there, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And Jesus responded, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The point is further made when considering the ministry of the apostles. During his ministry, the Lord Jesus gave his apostles the power to heal. As uh, Matthew puts it, to power, the power to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 10, verse 1. And he then gave them a charge as he go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Clearly the healing of the sick was intended to authenticate the message of the kingdom. The message of the king who has come to heal us from the disease of sin. And Luke's record of a, a similar incident, the sending out of the 70, makes the link quite explicit in Luke chapter 10, where Luke records Jesus saying, and, and heal the sick that are therein, and say to them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. As we progress through the New Testament, it's interesting to note how physical healing becomes significantly less prominent after the many healings that were done by the Lord Jesus himself uh, it begins to fade out uh, consider for example the uh, the cases in the book of Acts in chapter 3 uh, a lame man is healed by Peter as the instrumental cause opening the door to another presentation of the gospel to the Jewish people That's Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 10 then in chapter 8 uh, verse 7, uh, we tell us it, we're told in general terms that in Samaria, where Philip was uh, preaching Christ, many taken with palsies, I mean, paralyzed in other words, and that were, were lame, uh, were healed. In chapter 9, we have the record of Saul of Tarsus being healed from his temporary blindness. Also, then in chapter 9, we have the healing of Aeneas, who'd been bedridden for eight years, and uh, also the raising of Dorcas from the dead. And then we jump to chapter 14, a, a lame man healed by Paul uh, in the context of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles at Lystra, was paralleling the, uh, the, the uh, lame man in Jerusalem earlier, helped by Peter. And then chapter 19, we're told of special miracles done by the hands of, of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them. And it's worth noting there, that even in those apostolic times, such incidents are described as special miracles. And then we move right to the end of Acts, and we have the father of the Maltese chief, Publius, who was healed of a fever and a bloody flux or dysentery. And we're then told that this was when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island of Malta came and were healed. So in the whole of Acts, uh, covering almost 30 years, uh, we have the, the, record, the record of just eight incidents of healing, most of them in the earlier parts of the book. What is more, it's plain that the apostles didn't have power to heal at will, as the Lord Jesus did. Otherwise, why did Paul prescribe that Timothy should use a little wine for his stomach's sake and his oft infirmities rather than simply healing him? And why did he leave Trophimus at Miletum sick? Indeed, why did he not heal himself with his own infirmities rather than having to pray for the thorn in the flesh to be removed? If we suppose, uh, as many do, that his thorn in the flesh was some physical weakness. It's plain, isn't it, that physical healing is not the main thing. Once again, as with the healings of the Lord Jesus himself, every single instance of physical healing in Acts is linked with the preaching of the gospel. The point that Luke wants to stress following the healing of Aeneas in chapter 9, for example, is that all that dwelt in Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Similarly, following the healing of Dorcas in the same chapter, Luke comments, and it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. In short, these physical healings were just the prelude to souls being healed and brought to the Lord. And what's more, the intermittent and infrequent nature of the healing miracles performed by the apostles only serves to underscore that they were not really the healers. Their mission was always to point people to the Lord Jesus, the one who is truly able to heal our souls. He is the Lord who heals. So to wrap up this evening, our whole world, and mankind in particular, has been in need of healing ever since the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden brought death and disease into the world. No advances in medical knowledge will eradicate the reality 
of these things. And no number of initiatives by political leaders at climate change summits will heal our broken planet. Still less the absurd antics of Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain activists. Of course, concern for the environment has its place. But the greatest need for each one of us is to know the Lord as the one who heals us. By God's grace, that healing is experienced in conversion while we still live in this diseased world. The one who identifies himself as the Lord that healeth thee in the Old Testament is clearly the same as the one who identifies himself as the great physician of our souls in the New Testament. As Jesus himself put it, quoting from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What a blessing then it is if you and I have been made to be broken-hearted about our sin and have been healed by the Lord Jesus, the one who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. And yet, of course, we recognise we still face the sad reality of physical disease and ultimately death unless the Lord returns first. But still he is the Lord who heals. And it's plain enough that in the new heavens and the new earth, sickness will be banished forever. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. And there, in the New Jerusalem, we are told the leaves of the tree of life will be for the healing of the nations and there will be no more curse. Why not? Because there, our healer reigns. We praise God that he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we began this meeting by singing together, Heal us, Emmanuel. Here we are, waiting to feel thy touch, deep wounded souls to thee repair. A Saviour, we are such. We acknowledge, our God, that sin has ruined us, that we are spiritually sick from head to foot, sick in our hearts by nature. But how we give thanks. For thou art the Lord that healeth us. And we pray then, gracious God, that each one of us may rejoice to know that thou art the one that forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. May we then rejoice to know such a glorious and wonderful Jehovah. Receive our worship and our praise, we ask, as we draw near. In the name of thy dear Son, the one who demonstrated so abundantly uh, that uh, he is indeed the full expression of the Godhead in his healing of souls. Receive us in his name we ask. Amen. Amen.